Toy Story 2 is one of the very rare sequels that I'd consider to be perfect. It evolves the story in unique and organic ways while also putting our characters in situations that cause them to question everything they think they know and challenge their core beliefs. It introduced the series' best villain in The Prospector and two characters so indelible to the franchise in Jesse and Bullseye that it feels like they've been a part of the series from the very beginning. Well, what if I told you that Toy Story 2 was originally going to be very different? A movie that would see a cactus in the place of Jesse, a talking bullseye voiced by Martin Short, and a direct-to-video release plan. Well, that's the movie we'll be discussing today as we dive into the development, plot, and evolution of the original version of Toy Story 2. The year was 1995, and Toy Story took the world by storm. It may have only been a few weeks into the movie's theatrical run, but one thing was clear. This movie was a monster hit. In the wake of this success, talk of a sequel began when some of the minds behind the original movie, specifically John Lasseter, Ed Catmull, and Ralph Guggenheim, visited the newly appointed chairman of Walt Disney Studios, Joe Roth, who was very pleased with Toy Story and embraced the idea of a Toy Story 2. At this point, Disney also found themselves in the wake of another one of their movies' success, namely, The Return of Jafar. This movie was the first in what would become a long line of lower-budget, direct-to-video Disney sequels and spin-offs, and it left a massive first impression, netting Disney $100 million in profit. The success of Aladdin 2 showed Disney that there was definitely money to be made in these lower-budget, smaller-scale projects. Because of this, Roth enthusiastically commissioned Toy Story 2 as one of these hour-long direct-to-video sequels. From here, there were many unknowns. For starters, there was no story in place. And with the reduced budget, nobody knew if Tom Hanks or Tim Allen would be affordable. And even if they were, it was unknown if they even wanted to do a part two. There was even a span of time where Disney didn't even know if Pixar was going to handle the movie. They were deep into the production of A Bug's Life, so there was a chance that the movie would actually be traditionally hand-drawn and handled by Walt Disney Feature Animation. But eventually, things started to take shape. Ash Brandon, who was a directing animator on the first movie, was eventually chosen as the movie's director. Tom Hanks and Tim Allen also signed on to return, and it was decided that to animate, Pixar would enlist the team who worked on the two absolutely fantastic Toy Story computer games for their interactive products group. Over the course of developing these two games, they actually wound up making about as much unique animation for Woody, Buzz, and the gang as there was in the entirety of the first movie. Due to this familiarity, the video game studio was shut down and that studio staff became the core production team animating the film. This team was siloed off from the rest of the Pixar staff in a separate building nearby, but the first movie's director, John Lasseter, was close by to OK shots or call for edits as needed. To save on time, the animators would reuse assets from other Pixar films and shorts, though due to Pixar's quality-focused work culture, not as many as you would expect. The film's story was born out of a question posed by Lasseter, who thought about what a toy would find upsetting. It seemed like a natural progression from the first movie, where Woody was upset because he was being replaced by Buzz, and in effect, being played with less. So what if this time, Woody was put in a position where he couldn't be played with at all? Early on in the development of Toy Story 1, there was a draft of the script which included a hardcore toy collector. This idea was resurrected for the sequel in the form of Al McWiggin, and for Lasseter, this seemed like a natural fit, as he was an avid toy collector himself, and would often be hesitant to let his kids play with these vintage collectibles. And at some point, he realized, from a toy's perspective, being a collectible must be awful. This story obviously survived into the final version of the movie, but the mechanics and the way the story itself originally played out was quite a bit different. So without further ado, let's dive into the plot of this version of Toy Story 2. Our story begins in Andy's room. Sheriff Woody Pride does his morning check-ins with everybody, trying his best to keep them happy while Andy is away at camp. The toys are excited for Andy to return in a few days, but they're all making pretty good use of their time. Buzz, Rex, and Ham play the Buzz Lightyear video game, the Green Army men are taking a well-earned leave, and Bo Peep is spending some quality time with Woody. During one of these tender moments between Bo and Woody, they smooch. 
Woody catches on to a loose nail on Andy's dresser and rips a stitch on his pants, but he's a little too occupied to notice. The toys quickly discover that Andy's mom is holding a yard sale and begin to worry that they'll be sold while Andy is away. As Woody tries to calm everybody down, reassuring them that they'll be safe, the rip stitch pops and stuffing begins to fall out of Woody's pants. An embarrassed Woody stuffs it back in and slips out onto the roof to clear his head, but the shingle that he's standing on begins to come loose. Woody quickly slides off the roof and plummets into a box at the garage sale. Just then, a stubby Weasley man finds Woody and freaks out that he finally found a genuine 1958 Woody doll. Andy's mom turns down his offer for Woody and pries him out of his greasy hands, wondering how Woody got into the yard sale to begin with. He quickly improvises, kicking a skateboard into a lamp, causing a diversion, and stealing Woody. The toys watch on in horror as the man takes off in his car, license plate, L-Z-T-Y-B-R-N. That night, the toys hold a eulogy for Woody, but Buzz doesn't attend. He and Mr. Spell are off on the other side of Andy's room trying to decode what the mystery man's license plate may mean, and eventually they crack the code as Al's toy born. Buzz marches into the eulogy and reveals to the others that he believes Al himself took Woody, and that he's gonna go rescue him. Slink, Ham, Rex, and eventually even Potato Head volunteer to join Buzz on his mission. Across town, Al enters his penthouse apartment and immediately begins restoring Woody, cleaning him, buffing his head, presumably fixing the pop stitch on his jeans, and even repairing the burn mark left on his head from his and Buzz's misadventure at Sid's house. Woody is placed in a western town style display and meets three new toys. The Prospector, a posh old man who seems to be the leader of this trio, Senorita Cactus, a similarly posh cactus that definitely does not resemble any kind of redheaded cowgirl, and Bullseye, a talking horse who seems a little different from the other two, not seeming as posh. Woody pays them little mind and makes a break for the locked door. Upon his failed escape, he turns to the window to find a 20-story drop surrounded by a sprawling expanse of city. The quiet suburb where Andy lives is nowhere in sight. Woody pleads with them to help him escape so he could get back to Andy, but the Prospector and Senorita Cactus are revolted by the very idea of being played with because they don't see themselves as toys, they're collectibles. Woody is frustrated by this, that is, until the others show him Al's impressive toy display featuring everything from the show Woody was created for, Woody's Roundup. Everything from lunchboxes to vinyl records to posters, Woody is undeniably smitten by this, but eventually he goes back to plotting an escape. During this time, Bullseye tells him that he understands where Woody's coming from, that he was a toy in the 50s and loved being played with, and that he's tried to escape Al's apartment hundreds of times. But he's resigned himself to his life as a collectible because an escape through any window or door is impossible. Meanwhile, after a series of misadventures that causes everyone, Buzz included, to lose faith in him as a leader, the toys eventually make their way to Al's toy barn and eventually wind up in Al's office, only to overhear him on the phone saying that Woody is at his apartment. The toys all jump into Al's duffel bag to hitch a ride back to his apartment. That is, except for Buzz. He finds himself in an aisle packed with Ultra Buzz Lightyear 2000s, a flashier, newer model of him. A curious Buzz climbs up to inspect the display Ultra Buzz when it snaps to life, believing himself to be a real space ranger, and attacks our Buzz. The two Buzzes fight, and in the scuffle, a Box 4 and Emperor Zerg toy falls off the display. The box pops open, and Ultra Buzz and Zerg begin to fight. An acrobatic battle ensues, and our Buzz is amused, eventually walking into battle. Zerg shoots him with his ion blaster, and Buzz starts laughing as the nerf balls just bounce off of him as he walks up behind Zerg and rips his batteries out. Zerg flees in terror, and Ultra Buzz, impressed by R Buzz's bravery, gifts him his utility belt. R Buzz, with his self confidence now restored, runs out of the aisle to see his friends in Al's duffel bag, and he also hops in. By the time Al makes it back to his apartment, though, their stowaway plan hits a snag when Al leaves his bag in the car. We're treated to a montage of Woody becoming more and more posh and obsessed with becoming mint like the Prospector and Senorita Cactus, while also treating Bullseye like trash. Al has them inspected by a few curators from a museum, so they can become the centerpiece display for the Museum of 50s Objects, or as they like to call it, <laughs> MoFo.
These curators decide to purchase the Roundup Gang under the pretense that Al delivers the toys to them that night and that he removes Andy's name from Woody's boot, a blemish that he had no idea existed. As they leave Al's penthouse, Buzz climbs his way to the roof of the apartment using suction cups that Rex took from the toy barn. He uses an old tin can on the roof to cut a hole in Al's skylight. He grapples down and a now fully self-obsessed posh Woody, who doesn't want to leave, downplays their friendship, which absolutely infuriates Bullseye, who can't believe that Buzz actually came to save him. Buzz eventually manages to tie Woody up and get him onto the roof. They argue before Buzz reminds Woody that having Andy's name on his boot is a badge of honor. Just then, the prospector and Senorita Cactus get up to the roof and demand that Woody not leave. At this point, Woody has to choose his old life or his new life. But before he could make that decision, Woody's hat gets taken by the wind and he eventually winds up on a flagpole, dangling 20 stories over the city to get it. Buzz saves Woody, Woody snaps out of it and realizes that his life with Andy is spectacular and that they need to leave. But he also decides that he can't leave Bullseye with these two posh jerks. So Woody jumps back into the apartment to get Bullseye when the other toys that Al left in his duffel bag pour out of the heating duct. After sneaking their way onto the elevator and through vents, they're also here to rescue Woody. They hear Al coming back into the apartment and Buzz throws down some rope from his utility belt. He tries to pull them all up, but the weight is too much. Woody sacrifices himself, jumping off of the rope, touched by his selflessness. Bullseye follows Woody's lead and jumps off the rope as Buzz pulls everybody else up onto the roof as the Prospector and Senorita Cactus jump back into the room. Al packs up the entire roundup gang and brings them down to his car, followed by Andy's toys who hitch a ride on the top of the elevator. Andy's toys make their way into Al's trunk just before the car takes off. At this point, Woody has the idea to shove his hat into Al's car's tailpipe. This completely chars his hat and causes the engine to sputter. Al pulls into a gas station to check out what the problem is. From here, the toys push out the backseat armrest and commandeer Al's car. Al watches his car speed away in complete disbelief. Completely desperate, he steals the Pizza Planet truck that was gassing up nearby. As the truck tails Al's car, Woody begins throwing all of the other Woody's round of paraphernalia, which was also going to the museum, at the Pizza Planet truck, causing Al to fall behind in a cloud of shattered records, board games, and paint. The Prospector and Senorita Cactus watch this happen in horror before eventually beginning to fight Woody. The three of them fight through Al's car and eventually wind up on the sunroof. And just as Woody is on the ropes and is about to be burnt by the Prospector using the car's cigarette lighter, Bullseye makes his way to the top of the roof and kicks the Prospector and Senorita Cactus off of the car. The Pizza Planet truck begins to gain on Al's car when Al notices the Prospector and Senorita Cactus laying in the middle of the road up ahead. As he pulls up to retrieve them, two kids on bikes ride up and take the toys. Al has a total meltdown, and the boys make fun of him before riding away with the toys, leaving Al a blubbering mess in the middle of the road. The toys drive Al's car back to Andy's house, completely trashing it in the process. As they make their way up the driveway, Slinky notices that Andy's mom's minivan is coming down the street. Andy's about to be home. The toys hastily make their way up the side of Andy's house and into his room just as Andy opens the door to find his toys exactly where he left them. He notices Bullseye on the floor and immediately puts Woody and Buzz on his back as Andy's two favorite toys and his new favorite toy ride off into a future of countless more playtimes. The most interesting part of this version of the story is that a large majority of these elements made it into the final movie, just in a different form. There's obvious stuff like a second Buzz Lightyear and Zerg being in just one scene turning into the second Buzz and Zerg actually having an impact on the plot, and moving Bullseye's being a toy was great backstory to Jesse. It really goes to show that most of the key plot points existed pretty much from the jump. It just took a lot of rearranging to put them in their best positions. As its own thing, I think this story is fine. If this was the version that got made and we were all none the wiser, I think I'd probably like it and think it wasn't as good as the first movie, but ultimately wind up feeling like it was a perfectly inoffensive sequel. So that raises the question. With a clear production pipeline in place, along with a decent story, why did it change?
In November of 1997, Pixar screened some story reels and finished animation for Disney executives who were blown away by what they saw, and became interested in putting the movie out in theaters. Pixar agreed and work began in earnest to prepare the movie for a November 1999 release. This work continued on for about a year until the release of A Bug's Life. At that point, John Lasseter returned from promoting the movie's European release and watched the movie's development reels. As he watched, he came to a sobering realization. This movie wasn't working. It needed to be redone. Disney disagreed with this sentiment. There were only nine months until the movie was set to release. There just wasn't enough time to redo the movie. But Pixar decided that they couldn't allow themselves to put out the movie in the state that it was, and asked Lasseter to take over as director. Ash Brandon remained on the movie as a co-director, along with the addition of Lee Unkrich. To get the movie ready for a theatrical release, Lasseter would need to add about 12 minutes to the movie's runtime, and this proved to be a major challenge because it couldn't feel like filler. It needed to feel like it was always there. So instead of trying to slot things into the existing script, Lasseter invited key Pixar and Disney story people to his house for a weekend-long story summit, and over the course of just two days, they redeveloped the story from start to finish as the final movie we got, and the rest is history. That final version of the movie is so tightly wound. Every character and plot point complement each other and fit together so perfectly. And although many of those elements that made the final film great were there from the start, that level of narrative cohesion was very much not. And without that story summit, I doubt that the story would have found its way. In the end, it's definitely for the best that this movie got redeveloped. But that's the story of Toy Story 2's direct-to-video misadventure, and the end of yet another episode of Canned Goods. So until next time, thank you so much for watching, have a beautiful day, and stay hemmers.